So icons of evolution. Now, in this particular video, I'm not going to be talking about the arguments for creation or evolution or intelligent design. <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about a book written by uh, an evolutionary biologist who has a PhD in in biology, a, a degree in physical science, and who is written as a scientist really critiquing the illustrations that we've all grown up seeing in textbooks uh, that many scientists, most scientists and even evolutionists uh, acknowledge are not scientifically accurate, yet are the main pieces of evidence that people think of when they think of the argument, the proof, the evidence for evolution. So this isn't to say one way or the other on that particular issue, but to look at the, the icons of evolution and what are the, the pictures that we've seen. And let's talk about why pictures are so powerful. Stephen Jay Gould, who is not a creationist, he is an evolutionary scientist very famous in those scientific circles, wrote a book called The Wonderful Life about evolution. But he writes, the iconography, icons, pictures, the iconography of persuasion strikes even closer than words to the core of our being. Every demagogue, every humorist, Every advertising executive has known and exploited the evocative power of a well-chosen picture. But many of our pictures are incarnations of concepts masquerading as neutral descriptions of nature. These are the most potent sources of conformity, since ideas passing as descriptions lead us to equate the tentative with the unambiguously factual. Now there's a lot of uh, language there to break down and discuss, but really what he's, he's getting at is that iconography pictures are more powerful to us than just mere words. And everybody recognizes this. We recognize that a picture is worth a thousand words, that pictures are compelling, that they are powerful. And what he's saying is that pictures are incarnations of concepts. So there's an idea, a theory, uh, something that's out there can have evidence to back it up. It may not. But there's these ideas that are being suggested in a more humble way of this could be the reality. But when you put a picture to it, that our imagination fills in the gap to that is exactly what has happened, exactly what is. Pictures get attention. Pictures capture imagination. Pictures can be used to make something look true, even though it has not been proven. And that's what Gould is saying here as well. They're, they're potent sources of conformity since they're ideas passing as descriptions. So it's an idea rather than describing something that has actually been seen and observed. And he says that what this causes us to do in our human minds is to equate the tentative, what ideas are put out there, with the undoubtedly factual, that this is what is, this is the truth, this is what has been scientifically observed. And therefore, there is the great potential for pictures, but also the danger in pictures and visuals. Pictures can turn into something that's the may or the might, or the could be, or the might have been into this is what was, or this is what is, this is what's proven. Jonathan Wells, the author of this book, uh, has an undergraduate in physical science from UC Berkeley. And Berkeley obviously is not known for producing creationist scientists. Uh, and Jonathan Wells believes fully in evolution, but he is concerned with the misuse of pictures. And we'll see why. Uh, he has a graduate degree in biology, again from Berkeley. He has a PhD in religious studies from Yale, and then a second PhD in cell and developmental biology. So this is someone who is a scientist, who does have the scientific credentials. He does say in his book that 
the evidence should be presented and that people, even if they're not, uh, don't have degrees or the academic pedigree in the sciences should be able to evaluate it critically. And so he said in his book, this is one of the quotes, I believed almost everything I read in my textbooks. Why wouldn't you? You're not being presented often with alternative sources of information. And these pic uh, pictures in the textbooks are powerful. They're what will stick in our mind more so than the words. None of us can probably think back to a sentence that we ever read in a high school or college textbook, but we could probably all think back to a picture that we've seen in a textbook or a PowerPoint or something of that nature. And he says, his, the, the contention of his book is that the textbooks have well-known uh, errors and misrepresentations that have been proven scientifically wrong years previously. But these are the things that when people think of evolution that they automatically go to in their minds. He writes, since then, since his study is delving into this, since he's discovered his first deliberate or, uh, or obvious, say not deliberate, but obvious error in a textbook that was scientifically inaccurate, but had the picture uh, there. And he, he knew as a biologist that it wasn't true uh, and that this is well documented and that people knew about this, but the textbooks had not caught up to that reality and they still haven't largely. He writes, since then, I have discovered that many other textbook illustrations distort the evidence for evolution too. How could so many textbooks contain so many misrepresentations for so long? Why hadn't they noticed before? Then I discovered that other biologists have noticed most of them and have even criticized them in print, but their criticisms have been ignored. So there's a difference between People in their specializations in the sciences, whatever those may be, down to what is being produced for children to read, for teachers to read and teach on in science textbooks in college and high school science classes. That even though many biologists look at these things and they know that this picture is or that picture or that illustration is not accurate scientifically and even criticize them there's a breakdown in uh, that that accuracy catching up to the textbook and wells uh, suggests some reasons why he says the pattern is consistent and suggests more than simple error meaning says there are too many of these problems to be just coincidence he says at the very least it suggests that darwinism encourages distortions of the truth, but the result is clear. Students and the public are being systematically misinformed about the evidence for evolution. Now again, Jonathan Wells believes in evolution, but evolution is not synonymous with Darwinism. Most people think that it is, and most people even uh, believe Darwin's model. But most of these scientists recognize that the pictures are uh, inaccurate. And so he, he says that even evolutionists recognize this. And he says that students are being misinformed about what the evidence for evolution is. And if the evidence is there, then it should be evaluated critically. But I think most people should be able to agree, at least to give lip service to the fair-minded idea that people should not be led to a conclusion, even if it's true, with false evidence. And that's what Wells is arguing. Jonathan Wells and other scientists, even those who believe in evolution, uh, criticize the inaccuracies illustrated in textbooks. And evolution, it's, it's clear to make this distinction. It's important to make this distinction that it has several different definitions. If you ask me, do you believe in evolution? We would have to define the term. And this is one of the problems uh, of not doing a philosophy of any study because defining terms is key in philosophy, it's key in any study, but sometimes we fall into what's called the fallacy of equivocation, meaning speaking about the same word 
like evolution while having different ideas about what the meaning is. You have to do what is called operationalize the definition, meaning you have to give it, here is what I mean and here's what I'm going to talk about uh, and go back to when I when I use this this word. Otherwise, we can miss the point. So if you ask me on one definition, do you believe in evolution? The answer would be yes. If you ask me based on another definition of what evolution is, I would say no. Uh, so it's clear that it has to be carefully defined. So the theory of biological evolution, because there are different types, the theory of biological evolution, at least defined by Jonathan Wells and defined for the purposes of this video series, is that all living things are modified forms of a common ancestor in the past. All living things are modified forms of common ancestors in the past. Nobody debates, I mean, at least I don't know anybody, nobody debates <clears throat> that there is change over time. I've had friends say that, well, evolution just means one thing. It just means change over time. Nobody debates that. Nobody's debating that the dog or the wolf have had a common ancestor and that they've changed over time, that the Labrador that's domesticated and the, the wolf in the wild might have some relationship to one another. Nobody's debating that. Uh, the, the modification occurs that, that, is not a problem even for creationists. Uh, but the debate occurs of when new species, or I would say more particularly, when new kinds are created through this process of modification and natural selection. In other words, does it ever become something else? Can new information be added? That's what's debated. But Wells is not at the, the heart of that debate. What he's looking at are the pictures. So in any discussion on evolution, you have to start with presuppositions. That's the key thing. You have to define terms precisely. You have to ask for examples of what evolution uh, is understood to mean so that you can operate off the same definition going forward in any type of discussion on that topic. And then he goes on and says, when asked to list the evidence for Dar uh, Darwinian evolution, most people, including most biologists, give the same set of examples because all of them were learned from the same few textbooks. So biologists, uh, even evolutionary biologists, they often get on and specialize in their field. This is often true. And they remember back to what they read in their college te textbooks at the basics of when they learn, were learning biology in their undergrad classes or in high school. And they've moved on from that and they're specializing in a, a particular area of biology. So they're, they're not really operating with the, uh, using the ideas of evolution every day in their work. They're operating on what's in front of them in a microscope or something like that. Same thing with a, a study like history or economics. Uh, we study history in, in general. And then if you go on and you become a historian and specialize and you become a historian of the Civil War, well, a historian of the Civil War is not focusing on the basics of world history every day, though he or she may have learned it. And so that's what's going on. So even most biologists and most people will cite the same pictures they remember seeing uh, as evidence for evolution because they, these are the illustrations in the textbooks. Here, and here they are, and I'm gonna end with these. So one is the Miller-Urey Miller experiment that claimed to create life, the building block of life with amino acids in a lab with chemicals with a spark to simulate lightning. There's Darwin's tree of life from his origin of species that showed, uh, purported to show the uh, descent of life with modification. <clears throat> There's the homology in vertebrate uh, limbs that that these limbs are, are homologous. They they look the same in in the whale and the horse and the human and all these things. And this is purports to show evidence for evolution. There's Haeckel's embryos, another famous one. This is the one that Wells actually uh, that that got him thinking about this book, um, Haeckel's embryos that are compare different 
uh, animals and species and even human beings and fish and show uh, purport to show that they are the same or similar that they go through the same process and that these are what the embryos look like archaeopteryx the first bird and this is claiming uh, it's a bird with teeth and feathers and also has uh, scales i believe i'm remembering back to my college uh, textbook in biology and that it's it's purports to show this link between the uh, the dinosaur and the bird not in, a, in that direct of a way but in this this beginning modification sense that this is the missing link between um lizards lizard type creatures and birds so it's it's seen as being the first bird uh the peppered moths that uh were observed during the uh, industrial revolution and, and moths that were dark from uh, smoke and, and smog and pollution uh, tended to survive better than uh, than white moths. Darwin's finches, uh, the beaks, this is what brought Darwin to write the his famous book, Origin of Species, the finches in the Galapagos Islands. Four-winged flies that in a lab that uh, were, I believe, exposed to radiation, uh, and these flies uh, developed four wings instead of two. There's an example of a mutation that could cause, that could be evidence for evolution. The evolution of the horse uh, and, and horse fossils, different types of horses, uh, and how the horse has changed over time. Um, look at that. And then the, probably the most famous one is the uh, the ape to human, and now they don't they don't really say that we came from monkeys or that we came from apes. It's that apes and humans came from a common ancestor, and some modifications developed for a species of apes and monkeys and orangutans and all these things, and others developed into human beings, Homo sapiens. Okay, so this is the, the probably most famous illustration that shows the beginning uh, stages up through until it becomes man. Uh, here's another one of the uh, from Huxley uh, that shows these different skeletons of these different um, classifications of, of species of what are basically said to be the same thing, sharing a common ancestor. So those are the icons that wells goes over we're going to go over each one of those and show that it's not exactly what the textbooks claim it to be and yet it is used as compelling evidence for the theory of darwinian evolution i, I say darwinian evolution specifically uh, with regard to that definition of the theory so while many evolutionists um, believe in evolution in, in terms of the definition I gave earlier, they don't necessarily follow uh, Darwinism, uh, which is more closely followed in the United States. But we'll look at each one of those and show that these are actually mythical. They're not uh, the what the textbooks claim that they are. Uh, and if that is the case, at the very least, we don't have to get evolution out of the textbooks, that's fine. But let's at least get the, the inaccuracies out of the textbooks. Let's at least get the lies out of the textbooks. Let's at least get the, the non-scientific uh, evidence and, and get it out so that we're, we're giving people an honest and straightforward uh, factual account of what science is actually able to demonstrate.